37 years that the Lord has been working with Pastor Lewis and uh, his father. This thing goes back decades. And I'm just grateful that we are, we're drawing from some wells that have been flowing for decades. And, uh, and, and so I'm just, I'm just grateful to, to be a part of what, of what God's doing in this fellowship. I know it's only my second time to be with you, but I just feel at home. I don't know why. And I, I didn't have a, I, I just saw that key around your neck tonight, and I did, Louis, I don't know why you have that around your neck, but let me just ask you a question. Have you been asking God for kingdom keys? Okay, so I'm going to preach your key tonight. <clears throat> going to talk about kingdom keys. Gonna, I'm going to talk, talk about strongholds tonight. Now let me just ask a question. Are there any strongholds in Connecticut? Have I come to the right place? <laughs> so we're going to be looking at some strongholds and keys that will open strongholds that we face in our lives personally, in our families, in our communities, in our state. We're after strongholds. Lord Jesus, we're asking for your help and grace that, Lord, help me to speak this in a way that is true to your heart. And Holy Spirit, would you go beyond my weakness and would you speak directly to every person as we look in the word, go past my word and speak your word straight to every heart, everyone that's watching this on a screen right now as well, Lord, that there would be that impartation by your grace in Jesus' name. Our first scripture is 1 Samuel 17, 54. If you have a Bible, I invite you to find it. I don't care if it's digital or paper, but follow along. I think they are going to have verses on the screen to help us as well. 1 Samuel 17, 54. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. This is one of the more random verses in the Bible. And it's not random because David has the skull of a champion in his arm. It's random because of the mention of Jerusalem. At this time in history, Jerusalem is on nobody's radar. Saul is king. He's not king in Jerusalem. He's got another capital. Jerusalem, nobody's talking about Jerusalem yet. It's not going to happen until David becomes king. And so when he kills Goliath, he says to Saul, excuse me, I've just got to take a little personal trip right now. And Saul by himself takes the skull of the dead giant Goliath and takes it to Jerusalem. And we're looking at that going, David, why would you take the skull of a dead giant to Jerusalem? Let me try to answer that question. You need to understand something about Jerusalem. It's a city with two cities, actually. There's an old city, and then there's a new city. The old city was a stronghold called Zion. It was a fortress that had been built back in the ancient days, and then it was kind of small, and so the population outgrew it. They spilled outside the walls, and there was a new part of town, and so uh, when Joshua moved through the land, it, it might be
be a little confusing when you read the story because there's a verse that goes, they took Jerusalem, and then there's a verse that goes, they didn't take Jerusalem. Well, they were able to take the outer new part of town, but they couldn't take the stronghold of Zion, the old city. They couldn't take it. And so when David kills Goliath, he takes the skull of Goliath to Jerusalem because he has divine information. He hasn't told anybody, but God has told him. I think it's probably came from Samuel, but maybe even God told David directly. We don't know, but he's got divine information. God has told David, you are going to be king of Israel and your white house is going to be the stronghold of Zion. It's going to be your capital. He knows this already when he takes the when he kills Goliath, and so quietly by himself he goes off to Jerusalem, puts the skull of Goliath on a piece of rock, turns it to face the stronghold of Zion, and says in the spirit, "One down, one to go." Zion. You're coming down. Now the stronghold of Zion is actually not going to be taken for another 20 years. But David is making a statement in the spirit. Zion is coming down. When David finally becomes king, it's going to be 20 years later, that approximately 20 years later, that he's crowned king. And one of the first things he needs to do as a king, because uh, this is now when he becomes king of all 12 tribes. He's king of Judah for seven and a half years. But when he finally becomes king of the whole land, he's got to, well, number one, he has to build a military cabinet. He needs a captain of the army. He needs a military cabinet. And they're called in the Bible, David's mighty men. And to be one of David's mighty men, and right now I'm Speaking from Second Samuel 23, I'm actually not going to read from Second Samuel 23. If you want to find it and glance at it while I talk about it, you're welcome to do that. I'm going to talk about the chapter rather than read it to you. So David, he's now king, and he's like, okay, I, 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 need, I need some bad boys to sit at my cabinet with me and to plan my wars with me. And so uh, he chooses guys with the story. If you're going to be on David's military war cabinet, if you're going to be one of his mighty men, one of the captains in his army, You've got to have a story. And so uh, David's mighty man, when you read Second Samuel 23, it tells a little bit about this guy's story, this guy's story, this guy's story, this guy. For example, Adino, he's kind of the top dog. He killed 800 men solo. This is not the kind of guy to meet in Bridgeport on a dark night. <laughs> I mean, here's Samson. Samson killed a thousand. Adino, 800. The guy's bad, you know what I'm saying? Next on the list is Eliezer. Eliezer's got a story to tell. He says, yeah, let me tell you my story. He says, the Philistines were over here, were over here, and all of a sudden, the Philistines decided to attack. We weren't quite ready for it. And everybody goes, the Philistines are attacking, and everybody went this way. Eliezer goes, something came on me. I said to myself, I'm not going that way. I'm going this way. I grabbed my sword. Nobody came with me. I grabbed my sword and I start heading for the Philistines. Something came on me. I began to swing my sword and down they went. Down, 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 down. By the time it was done, they tried to get the sword out of my hand and they couldn't. 
couldn't get it out of my grip because my fingers had frozen around that sword and everybody else just came back for plunder. Eliezer. Shama. He's got a story. He's next to the Shama. Shama goes, I'll tell you my story. He goes, it was lentil season. We had plowed, we had seeded, we had fertilized, water, grown, tended everything. Now it's time for harvest. We're harvesting the lentils. And the cry goes up. Here come the Philistines. Everybody scrammed. Shemmy goes, something came on me. I don't know, I've never really felt anything like this before. Something inside me goes, I'm not going that way. I'm going to stand right here. I took my sword. I took a stand on that ground of lentils all by myself. The Philistines came, and I began to swing my sword, and they went down, 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 down. By the time it was over, there were bodies everywhere, and God gave us a mighty victory. One of the common denominators of the stories that David's men had to tell was single-handed exploits. Everybody ran. Nobody stood with me. Somebody goes, yeah, I know what that's like. In my darkest hour, the body of Christ was not there for me. Could it be? You're set up for an exploit. The reason it needs to be a single-handed exploit is because we need to know who did God use. So, if you're going to be one of David's mighty men, you've got to have some stuff under the hood. You've got to be, number one, you've got to be gifted. Number two, you have to, uh, you got to be trained. Number three, you've got to be buff because it's not enough to be gifted and trained if you're not buff. So you've got to be exercised. But that's still not enough. You've got to be experienced. But those four are still not enough. A fifth ingredient, anointing. Something came on me. I've never quite felt anything like it. It was actually the anointing that rested on David. And the Davidic anointing would come on his mighty men. They would enter into the same Davidic anointing and do exploits because of the Holy Spirit resting upon them. And if you're going to be a captain, a mighty man, a mighty woman of God in the army of God, anointing by the Holy Spirit. Now, there was one person in the the group of the in the mighty man that's not mentioned in second samuel 23 and we're going to go into his story tonight it's an unusual story so unusual in fact that it gets its own separate mention in the bible to get his story you have to go to second samuel chapter 5 so this is our text tonight it's second samuel 5 it's going to be the story of the guy that qualifies to become the captain over the whole army. It, 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 David has a, quite a challenge in front of him. When he becomes king over the whole land and he needs to establish a captain over the army, who do you put over a guy like Adino? <laughs> An Eliezer. And Shama. Who are these guys going to salute? So quite a challenge to find a captain over.
over these bad boys. So he's got that challenge, and then he's got a second challenge in front of him. We've got to take the stronghold of Zion. It's coming down. It's my White House. It's going to be my capital. The very first thing that David does after he is coronated king over the whole land, 2 Samuel 5, verse 1 is the coronation, 2 Samuel 5, verse 6, taking of Zion, it's job number one as king of the land. So he's got two challenges, he's got to take the stronghold of Zion, and he's got to find a captain over all these bad boys. And he decides that he's going to kill two birds with one exploit. He's going to make the taking of Zion a qualifying feat. Whoever pulls this one off will be captain over the whole lot. Our text, let's just go ahead and read the story. 1 Samuel 5, verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. By the way, they're Gentiles. Jebusites, just the ancient name for the people that lived in that fortress. The inhabitants of the land who spoke to David saying, you shall not come in here, but even the blind and the lame will repel you because they thought David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Now, Joab is not mentioned by name in our, in our scripture. You have to go to the sister passage because Kings and Chronicles have sister passages. If you go to the First Chronicles 11 sister passage, it names Joab as the one who pulls this feat off. So we know Joab is the one who's gonna pull this thing off. And so David decides to make the penetrating of Zion a qualifying feat. It's kind of like the triathlon. If you can take Zion, there's a whole, you've got to have a whole lot going under your hood. You've got to have more than just swordsmanship. You've got to have ingenuity, agility, endurance, creativity, quick on your feet, uh, courage, a whole gift set that if you're going to pull this one off, you've got to have it burning on several cookers. So, uh, cooking on several burners, rather. So, if you're, if you can pull off this one, a guy like Adino will go, yes, sir. It's the ultimate challenge. Now, you and I might look at this story and just think to ourselves, well, Taking a stronghold like Zion shouldn't be that tough. I mean, you just build a siege around the fortress and starve them out. Not that easy. Zion had indoor plumbing. Now to us today, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but back then, you're talking about a very arid part of the world where water was everything. It was the life source for a community. And Zion had an indoor, year-round source of fresh water. I'm going to tell you about it. The reason Jerusalem sits where it is today is because of one geological feature, a spring called the Gihon. When the earliest settlers 
partners of the land came to that part of the land and they were looking for springs and well places to build wells and you know dig wells and so on they came across something unusual there was this on this hill a spring that actually produced water year around remarkable in that kind of an arid culture. It's because Jerusalem is surrounded by like something like seven mountains and they fed these underwater fissures that produced a year-round spring called the Gihon. Now the Gihon was an intermittent spring, has an underground siphon kind of effect. And in the rainy season, it would produce water maybe six, seven, eight, nine times a day. But here's the kicker. In the heat of summer, it would produce at least once a day. And the early settlers are going year-round supply of water. We're setting up camp. So they set up a little camp around this spring, their tents and so on. And as the decades and uh, who knows centuries as it went along, they, they, they decided, somebody came up with an idea. It was actually quite brilliant. They said, here, how about if we were to build a fortress on top of this hill and then dig into the mountain and redirect the waters of the Gihon Spring so that the water would flow into the middle of the mountain. We'll dig a cistern in the middle of the mountain, right underground, and then we'll build a shaft that will go straight vertical to the top of the mountain so that we can actually send a bucket of water down, dip it into the cistern in the middle of the mountain, bring it to the surface, and we have fresh water in our fortress year-round. It was a remarkable idea, and they did it. I don't know who had the job. Somebody had the job of digging that tunnel through straight rock. That was a challenge. And so I'm going to describe for you now how this thing actually looked because we've got, because of archaeological studies and, and so on, we've been able to piece together a pretty decent idea of how this thing actually worked. So, uh, I, I think I'm going to be pretty close on my description. They chiseled into the mountain about 30 feet. And then, get in 30 feet where the water is trickling into through the tunnel. Has to be big enough, obviously, for a man to crawl through and dig his way through. And then, they built a cistern to hold water. And then, a little... Uh, uh, what can I say, uh, a, a walkway in the middle of the mountain. You walk here, take some steps, up some steps, and then you get to a, like a platform area that the water shaft went straight up from this platform area, 50 feet up. They have photos of it on the internet today. You can go on the internet and see photos of this water shaft. It's called Warren's Shaft. So if you Google Warren's Shaft, you'll see on, on your screen pictures of this water shaft. It's called Warren's Shaft today because a guy by the name of Charles Warren in 1867 found the thing archaeological dig, they found it, and the walls, you'll see it, they're very smooth, and the thing, the, the, the water shaft, I don't know how, it might be maybe this kind of a circumference, and a very smooth walls, 50 feet down. So, and then, the water, 30 feet in, the water is coming in, filling the, the, the cistern underground, and then they had to build an outlet because
because if you have no outlet for water, it gets, it, you know, just like the Dead Sea gets dead. And so another guy had a job to dig an outlet. The outlet went 500 feet through the mountain to way across the other side of the mountain. 500 feet through hard, solid rock and outlet to overflow so that you got the intake, cistern, outlet. Then, okay, now I think, now this is all theory, this is a theory right now. I think they had a two rope system on that water shaft. I've been looking at this thing for years. I think it was a two rope system. One rope was used to crawl up and down the 50 foot shaft, if you wanted to get up or down. The other rope was used to hoist a bucket of water. So you, it's a two man job. You got one guy down below, he takes a bucket, dips it into the cistern, gets a bucket of water up the path of the stairway, gets it up to the platform, connects it to the rope, and then you got a guy at the surface, 50 feet above, who pulls in the rope and gets the bucket to the surface. One rope for walking up and down, one rope for getting the pail up and down. I've got a two rope system in my brain. <clears throat> the stronghold of Zion. Now, what was a stronghold back in those days? Because it's called a stronghold in our text. In the concept of our text, the stronghold was a, a, a fortification that was difficult to conquer because of its supportive topography. Let me explain what I mean by that. You've got a fortress built on top of a hill, the hill of Zion. So if people wanted to take the fortress out, if you come from this side, you got a hill and then a stone fortress. If you tried to come to Zion from this side, you got a hill and then a stone fortress. If you try to take on Zion from this side, a hill with a stone fortress on top. And then the one side that was kind of flat, iron gate. Zion was impregnable. And if you tried to take on Zion, if you tried to attack Zion from down there, we had a welcome wagon committee welcoming you to town. <laughs> on top of the wall were, it was a welcome committee. They had a variety of gifts to give you if you were new to the neighborhood. Things like flaming arrows, boiling oil, millstones, projectiles, anything that they could think of to throw your way to say welcome to the neighborhood. So three sides, it was a stronghold. How can you take this thing on? And then on the one side that had a flat access, an iron gate. Nobody could take Zion. When Joshua and his bad boys came through, they couldn't take the stronghold of Zion. When the men of Judah came through later, they couldn't take Zion. When the men of, uh, of, uh, of Benjamin, the Benjamin tribe, they came through, they couldn't take Zion. Saul didn't even try. Zion was impregnable, and it represents for us tonight a stronghold is anything that resists the will of God for God's people. It 
could be something in your life personally. It could be something in your family, in your community, in your church. Something, a, a, a holdout of darkness that is resisting the will and the promises of God that he has given to you personally, that he has given to your church, that he has given to the kingdom in an area. And I think there are some strongholds that we face here in Bridgeport. I don't necessarily understand what the strongholds are. You know them better than I do. But they are resisting the purpose of God to move forward as a church to, in his promises to his people in this hour. And so I want you to personalize what we are about to talk about tonight. I want you to personalize just whatever stronghold you're facing, whatever way you connect with it personally. Make it a personal application for your life. For me, I'm going to present the stronghold of Zion tonight as a stronghold of physical infirmity, sickness, and disease the stronghold of the blind and the lame. You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Zion was kind of like a final frontier. Israel had been able to conquer the land over here, over here, over here. They had been able to take all the land around it. And yet in the middle of the land stood a stronghold that although they could conquer everything else, they could not take the stronghold of Zion. It was like the final frontier. And physical infirmity and sickness is like that in the body of Christ. We've been able to conquer in so many ways in the body of Christ, in our cities, in our communities, but there is a, a, a stronghold that still stands in the church today, and there comes a mocking, taunting voice from the voice, it's a voice of darkness that says to the church, you can't take this one. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is healing people today. I give thanks for every miracle. I give thanks for every healing. I, I hear testimonies all the time of God touching people, Jesus healing people. So Jesus is healing people in the church in this hour. But in contrast to the need, yeah, it's a tiny fraction of the need in the body of Christ in the church. So when you look at this thing in broad general strokes, there is the stronghold in the church in 2021. I'm talking about cancer. I'm talking about multiple sclerosis. I'm talking about diabetes. I'm talking about physical sickness and then fibromyalgia, arthritis. I'm talking about diseases that are in this room tonight. I stand before you as sample number one of physical infirmity in my, in my voice. I've been after this thing for 29 years. If I could tell you how many people have prayed for me. And a mocking voice comes and says, you're not going to take this one. I hear it especially in America. There's a voice that I hear in my ear. I don't know if you've heard anything like this, but I hear a voice that goes something like this. Maybe if you were in some poverty-stricken nation in Africa or something, you might have a chance at this thing. But not in America. You're too soft. 
you're too lazy, you got too many hospitals, you got too much, not too many prescriptions, you got too many doctors, you got too many options, you're, you're too sluggish, you're too unbelieving, not in America. And I just want to preach verse 7 to the forces that speak those kind of mocking voices because it says in verse 7, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. And I say in the Holy Spirit tonight, nevertheless, the son of David, Jesus Christ, is once again going to take this stronghold. He took it when he was here on earth 2,000 years ago, and everyone was healed under his ministry. And I'm going to say it boldly in the Holy Spirit. There is a day of visitation coming to the church when everyone is going to be healed, when all that come to Jesus Everybody that came to Jesus got healed, and I'm contending for that to come because Jesus said, greater works than these will you do. There is a day coming, and my heart is laboring for this, when the blind will see, when the deaf will hear. I believe that it's coming to the church Lord Jesus, give it to us in Bridgeport, Connecticut, we ask tonight. Verse 8. Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. I want you to look with me at Two very curious statements in that verse. The lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. I'm just going to make it personal for me tonight. I hate affliction. I hate infirmity. I hate the way spirits of infirmity will bind people in prisons of affliction. I hate multiple sclerosis. I hate cancer. I hate ulcerative colitis. I hate cerebral palsy. I hate diabetes and epilepsy. I hate how demons of darkness will incarcerate people in prison houses of affliction and infirmity. They sit in their hovels. The life is being squeezed out of them. The hope is gone from their eyes. Every dream they had for their life has been totally stripped away from them. They are no longer able to contribute to their family, to contribute to society. They are a drain on everybody they touch, everybody that has to take care of them. They have no life vision. They have no life purpose. All they do is try to subsist and exist for one more day. They swallow their pills. They stare at their screens. All hope has been stripped from their lives. And I hate how demons of infirmity and affliction strip the life and the hope and the vision and the destiny from people that should be fruitful in the kingdom and producing an eternal harvest, but they are incapable of it because they are prisoners of affliction. And Isaiah 14, 17, when Satan gets you in his prison, he never lets you go. The only way that you're going to get out of that prison, somebody has to plot a prison break. <clears throat> the other curious phrase in our verse, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. I'll tell you what it means for me personally. The blind and the lame are not in the house tonight. They're not here. I don't know if 
okay if, if you've noticed. Now, I've got some pretty strong lights in my eyes right now, and I can't see in the, in the group here tonight very well. So there might be somebody out there that's got a cane or, uh, or maybe somebody that, that might be blind that I just can't see you. But for the most part, I didn't notice any wheelchairs being brought in tonight. I didn't notice any stretchers being brought in tonight. I didn't really notice anybody with the walking like a blind cane. I didn't notice anyone with prosthetics or uh, I didn't see anybody coming in with an oxygen tank. For the most part, the captives to affliction and infirmity, the blind and the lame, they're not in the house. I never quite understood this, Adrian, until this happened to me. And when this happened to me, I had a aha moment. I saw it. Because, Louis, I don't know if, it, if I'm going to try to explain this to you, bro. I was, <laughs> I was 35 years old. When this happened to me, I'm pastoring a church. I loved my church. I loved what I was doing as a pastor. And when this happened to me, going to church became the hardest part of my week. Because everything inside of me wanted to talk to my flock. I want to talk to you. I want to connect. I, want, I, I, want. I could not physically talk to my flock. I'm walking around my church. I'm the senior pastor, and I'm walking around with a notepad, walking up to people visiting our church for the first time. Hi, I'm Bob. Welcome on a notepad. It was killing me. My week was kind of like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday recovery, and then the weekend. Oh, crash. It would take me all week to semi-recover, to face another weekend of going to the house. It was so hard as a captive to go to the house. And I realized, now I know why they're not here. It's just too hard. Why would I get up the extra three hours early in the morning to go through all my routine to get myself ready so that the special needs vehicle will take me in my wheelchair, take me to the church where they'll wheel me up and the only place they have room for me is right in the front so everybody can see me sticking out. I'm the only one that can sing. Everybody else can dance, but I can't dance. Everybody else can hear, but I can't hear. Everybody else can see, but I can't see. Everybody else can connect, but I can't connect. Why would I do that when I know that all they're going to do is turn my wheelchair around, wheel me out. I'm going to leave the building the same way I came. Why would I go through all of that and then leave the same way I came? It's too hard. They're not here tonight because they don't exist in Bridgeport, Connecticut. If you think that we have no captives in Bridgeport, yeah, Connecticut, yeah. I've got news for you. They are everywhere in their wheelchairs, in their prison houses. And one day a sound is going to go forth in Bridgeport, Connecticut. God is visiting his people. They are coming out of their wheelchairs. They're, we they're coming in within their wheelchairs. They're leaving, pushing their wheelchairs. When the sound goes out that God is visiting his people in signs and wonders and miracles, the captives are going to come from everywhere. And you're going to be like, the room is 
full of wheelchairs. Where were all the wheelchairs? They've been in your city all along. The captives are everywhere. They're just not coming to the house. But when Jesus visits his church, they're going to come because there's scriptures actually that talk about the lame being gathered. There's only one thing that gathers lame people. It's the miracle power of Jesus Christ. It's coming to the church. So David provides a strategy and an incentive for taking this stronghold. First of all, the strategy. He says, we're going to take the stronghold by going up the water shaft. I have a theory. I don't know if I'm right on this, Steve. It's, a to it's kind of a wacky theory. I've got a theory. I wonder if David, when he was a kid, because when David's a kid, he's a shepherd, and shepherds wander all over the place. Bethlehem wasn't that far from Jerusalem. I've got David as a kid taking his flock and even, you know, by that part of the, of the land. And I'm wondering if David ever went to the outlet where the water comes out of that 500-foot tunnel, if he ever crawled up that tunnel as a kid. Okay, there's part of the story I forgot to tell you. When they redirected the Guion Spring into the mountain, they built a fortification around the entry point because that was the source of the water. So you've got a fortification. I mean, this is, there's archaeology for this. They had, there's a, there was a fortification at the base where the, where the Gihon Spring came out. They built a fortification to protect the water source that goes 30 feet into the mountain. And then it was manned by warriors so that if you tried to go after the water, they were protecting that. Nobody was thinking about protecting the outlet. 500 feet down the other side of the field, going over toward the pool of Siloam, who would ever worry about where that murky, slimy, sludgy hole way over that side of the field? Who knows what kind of critters are living in that thing? It, I mean, nobody is going to mess with that kind of a foul stench that comes out the outlet. I wonder if David, he had the moxie for it. I wonder if David, as a kid, ever was like, I wonder what's up that tunnel. I don't know. Because somehow David knows the way in is up the 500-foot tunnel Get yourself into that cistern in the middle. Work your way up the steps and then water shaft time. He says, we're going to access it through the water shaft. That's the strategy. We need divine strategies in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I think we're going to get this on our knees, Pastor. Strategies in the spirit, divine ideas, how to take the strongholds that are before us. Jesus, give us the strategy. And then David provides the incentive. David goes, whoever can pull this one off, will be captain over the whole army. There's a young book, 25-ish. His name is Job. Is there anybody 25 in the room? Do I have a 25-year-old in the room? Who's going? 
close. What's his name? James. James. That's almost Joab. <laughs> James. I love this. So, a young guy, his name is Joab. He's actually David's nephew. And he's like, he comes to the king, he says, Your Majesty, I'd like to give it a shot. David goes, well, I told, I said, whoever wants to. I put the sound out to the whole nation. Universal limitation. Anybody that can go, anybody that wants to can go for it. And something touches the heart of a 25-year-old buck. And he goes to, he says to himself, Captain Joab. <laughs> it has a ring to it. I like the sound, and it incentivized something in Joab. Listen, if you're going to take a stronghold in the kingdom, you've got to be incentivized. Something that's inside of you that goes, I want that. And sometimes the way he incentivizes us is not always pleasant. He'll corner you. He'll trap you. He'll get you in a situation where now you've got like, uh, you're desperate. Like, I, I've got to do something. And he'll incentivize you by making you desperate. Something has to change here. Never despise the way God chooses to incentivize you. You find yourself trapped in a prison. You're like, I've got to break loose of this prison. Incentive. To go after the water shaft. So Job, he's like, I'm going after the water shaft. <laughs> now, how Joab pulls this one off, we do not know. How many will um, how many will grant me? The text is kind of small. Just not a whole lot of detail here. So I'm gonna use some and some sanctified imagination. <laughs> Can I have license for some sanctified imagination? Okay, here's what I don't want you to do. When we get to the other side and get the story real clear and straight, I don't want you hassling me. <laughs> well, Bob, I you sure had that one off. Okay, I'm just going to give it my best shot, Bob. You know what I'm saying here? So, so this is my best shot. I got a friend Bob here tonight. We, we Bobs, we stick together. <laughs> so, Bob, I'm, I'm going to give you my best guess at how Joab pulled this thing off. Did I say James? I meant Joab, sorry. <clears throat> James, I've got this as a night job. I think it's a night job. He's going to go where that 500 foot tunnel goes out to the other side of the field and it comes out by then, it's kind of slimy and ugh. And he's gonna make his way from that opening 500 feet through the mountain. I think it's a nighttime job. I don't think you do this in the middle of the day where the Philistines are, or the Jebusites are going, hey, look at that guy crawling into the hole in the mountain. I don't think you do this at noon. I think you do this one at midnight. So I've got it a nighttime job. I've got Joab at midnight hidden for the outlet. Back in those days, they did not have battery-powered flashlights. They did not have, you know, it's like, I, I, I don't think the guy's carrying a, chor a, a, a torch because, okay, whoever carved that fire, 
500 foot tunnel, that outlet, it was, it was minimal. He's like, I'm only gonna carve what I have to to get my body <laughs> through this thing. So it was some skinny guy that did a minimal job just to carve a path so that he could, you know, finish the job. <clears throat> so I don't think there's room, I don't even think you carry a sword with you. I think you get down to your skivvies. Okay, this is not, a, it's coming off, you know what I'm saying? So I've got Joab taking the stuff off so that he can do, there's no torch, there's no sword, there's no nothing, it's, I've got to crawl. And he is crawling. Now there's a hint in the scripture that he may have had one or two guys follow him. We don't know. Was he so low? Did a couple guys, one or two guys, you know, compatriots? We don't know. But anyways, so through the muck, through the mud, through the, get that raccoon out of here. <laughs> this was not a good thing. Okay, it was not pleasant. On his belly, 500 feet in the middle of the night, crawling through muck and dirt and slime and, okay, spiders, snakes, what do they have in these kind of places? I don't know. Crawling your way through all of this, 500 feet on his belly, until suddenly, plop, he's in a pool of water. It's the cistern. He's made it 500 feet to the cistern in the middle of the mountain. I think he stopped to wash off a little bit. There's got to be an access here somewhere to the water shaft. Total darkness. 30 feet away is the fortified entry point to the Gihon Spring. It's manned. You got to be quiet. You don't want the guys 30 feet away knowing that you're in the pool quietly feeling, can't see a thing, blacker than black, in the middle of a mountain, in the middle of the night. If you're gonna take on the stronghold, get ready for blackness. Somebody goes, why have all the lights gone out in my life? Why am I in such a season of blackness? I cannot see anything. I have no idea where I am. I have no idea where I'm going. God's not talking to me. My life is total blackness. Could it be he's training you for the watershed? Because if you're going to take this thing, you're going to have to know blackness. You're going to have to know slime and grime. It's going to be demon's breath. Feeling his way. He finds the corridor that goes from the cistern through, and you can actually see some of these steps online. I, I, I've got a book actually that shows pictures. You walk up these steps, take a little turn, walk up some more steps, and you get yourself to a platform. So in the middle of the darkness, he finds his way, and he's like, I think this might be the water shaft. It's smooth. Nothing go, okay. I think I'm in the water shaft now. I've got him in the water shaft at 2 a.m. That's my guess. It's 2 a.m. and he's found the water shaft. How did Joab get up that water shaft? By the way, trained mountain climbers have navigated that water shaft with their equipment. So it's possible if you're trained and have equipment. How did he get up there? My best guess. My two-rope system I'm suggesting 
there was a rope that guys would climb up and down to get access. And here's my theory. When they first built the thing, they would pull the rope up at night for to safeguard. But after you've done that for how many decades, you kind of get to the place where you know what? Why aren't we pulling the rope up every night? We've got guards guarding the entryway. That's good enough. Let the rope stay. I think the rope they crawled up and down the water shaft, they just eventually just left it hang in there. Joab finds the rope and crawls 50 feet up. And at 2.10 a.m., <laughs> he is at the top of the water shaft. He is inside the stronghold of Zion. Zion was not ready for a dude like James, excuse me, like Joab, <laughs> to show up at 2.10 a.m. He goes over to the gate. There's a guard at the gate, but the guy's asleep. I mean, you know. He knocks off the guard. That's easy for a guy like Job. Knock off the guard. I had no problem with that. The problem is we've got to open this gate. How do you open the gate to this stronghold? So now, back in those days, an iron gate, and they would have a bar, a metal bar, that would go into the wall that would secure the gate. And you had to find a way to engage the bar, get the bar to move out like this, and now the iron gate will open. The Bible talks about bars and gates. And so, Job goes, he finds the bar, and he tries to move the bar. It's locked. They lock the gate. <laughs> How am I going to get this gate unlocked? There's got to be a key somewhere. Checking around the guard hut. Where is the key to this door, this bar? Something occurs to him. Check the guard's belt. He goes over to the dead guard, checks out the guard's belt. Maybe it was hanging around his neck, I don't know. <laughs> Finds the key on the guard. Let's put him on his neck. Around the guard's neck, the key. He takes the key. He's now got the key to the door. How does the stupid key work? And he's trying to find a way to insert this key somewhere so that it engages the bar so the bar can move and the door can open. It's metal on metal. And he's starting to make noise. Somebody up there, hey! What's going on down there? We're talking adrenaline racing through his body. 2.20 a.m. Sure would have been nice, Lord, if you gave me a full moon. I can't hardly see what I'm doing here. Make a noise. He waits five minutes. I've got to find a way to get this key to unlock this thing. It's metal on metal. He's making noise. Somebody goes, hey. He hears footsteps. They are coming to check out the noise. Adrenaline is moving through it. There's got to be a way to get this key in this blasted torch. And as he's messing with the thing, something changes. And he pushes on the bar. The bar moves. And around 2.30 in the morning, Joab pushes open the gate of Zion. 
thousand Israelite warriors have been watching that gate. When they see that gate begin to open, the guy with the bugle, the trumpet, sounds the trumpet blast. The whole army arises from hiding, and when the door is open, the entire army of Israel rushes the gate, and the stronghold is taken in minutes. Joab does not conquer the stronghold. He simply opens the gate from the inside. Somebody has to open the gate from the inside. There are some strongholds that you have to take from the enemy on the enemy's turf. You actually have to go into the hell hole and open the fortress from the inside. When a kingdom door is opened from the inside, it gives access to the whole body of Christ. One miracle can open the gate for a whole city. In fact, when you study some of the history of people that God has used in supernatural miracle healing, John Wimber is an example of this, there is a gate opening miracle that when that miracle happened, it opened a gate in the spirit for now a flood of the body of Christ to enter into a holy destiny in God. But somebody has to take on the water shaft and open the gate from the inside. And you wonder, why am I in this prison? Why am I in this darkness? Why am I facing this kind of an impossibility in my family? in my situation, in my life. Why is it so oppressive? Why is it so dark? Why does nobody help me? Why am I by myself? Is there anybody with a spirit of Job on them that will take on the water shaft, that will take on the darkness, that will rise up through the water shaft, find a key in the spirit, and open the gate from the inside. There's somebody right now, you might be thinking to yourself something like this. Bob, I appreciate all this. It's, you know, we're clapping our hands and it's moving us and stuff, but it's so Old Testament. Give us something a little bit New Testament tonight. Thank you for asking. <laughs> the captain of your salvation, the one who earned his rank as the captain of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, commander of heaven's armies. Let me tell you how the captain of your salvation earned that rank. He was crucified. He died. He descended into the hell hole. And then he ascended up the shaft of hell. And he opened the gates of hell from the inside. He did it from the inside. And he's called us to follow in his steps. 
That's First Peter 2, 21. We now follow in his steps. And he invites, because he says, I've got a rank for you. I want you to be a mighty woman of God. I want you to be a mighty man of God. I've got a rank. I want to make you a lieutenant. I want to make you a commander. I want to make you a general. I want to give you a place of distinction. But you're going to have to do it. some of this lingo in there and I just want us to come back and we're just going <clears> to <throat> let me just remind you of one thing David, uh, David said he goes whoever whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft it wasn't a holy appointment it wasn't God going James it's you it was something in Job going Give me a shot. The invitation goes tonight to the whole body of Christ. Whoever. Does anybody have a spirit of Joab? Does anybody have a, has anybody been incentivized? Does anybody have a reach in their spirit Looking at a stronghold, you don't have to imagine your stronghold. You're looking at that thing straight in your face. It's in front of you. I, if you don't have a stronghold, don't, don't imagine it. Because if there's a stronghold in front of you, you don't have to imagine it. It's right there. You know exactly what it is. And now something inside of you is, I'm going after this stronghold. May the grace of God help you. May he put some moxie in your spirit. May there be a holy, something that will take hold of you to empower you. Because this thing will require every reserve of your soul, every reserve reserve of your mind, all your time, all your effort. It, you'll have to go deep in the spirit. You're going to have to go deep in the word. You're going to have to go to places in the spirit you've never gone before. You're going to smell demon's breath. This thing is going to be, it's going to be the bite of your life all consuming. But if you'll take on the water shaft, there are doors to be opened in the spirit that the body of Christ can now come through and enter into their destiny. The message is finished. Now here's what I want to do. I want to be available as we sing this song just to pray, just to lay my hand on anybody that comes to the front. This, I'm not asking everybody to do this, but if something about this message is connecting for you and you're just like, Bob, I'd just like you just to put your hand on me silently and agree with me in prayer because I'm going to be silent. I'm finished here. Uh, but for the most part, I want us to respond right where we are. Your seat where you sit, where you stand, is your altar with God. Do business with God now. Just talk to Him. Let Him talk to you. A mighty man of God. A mighty woman.
woman of God. Like David's mighty men. Put it in us, Lord. Give us a deposit in our spirit that gives us the focus to gather all of our strength and focus it on one thing. This one thing I do, I'm going after this stronghold. Lord, I'm asking for those that this is personal for tonight, that you would make it clear, make it straight, and guide our heart. Put a spirit of Job on a young man in this room. Put a spirit of Job on a young woman in this room. Anoint somebody tonight, Lord, to take on the water shaft and open the gate from the inside. I bless you in Jesus' name. Year 38, let's go after strongholds. Jesus, give us the keys of the kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.